Hello, this is uh, the National Balloon Museum in Indianola, Iowa in um, July of 2013 and we are uh, doing a little um, interview with our Hall of Famers and the first one is? Not a Hall of Famer. Well, the <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, right, I am uh, the uh, son of a Hall of Famer. My name is Eric Floden, originally from Flint, Michigan, currently live in Washington, D.C. And I'm Denny Floden, father of this. <laughs> and I'm from uh, originally South Bend, Indiana, and then to uh, Flint, Michigan, and finally Anna Maria Island, Florida, Bradenton Beach. But he's also better known as Captain Fogg. <laughs> because he's always in a fog. I resemble that. Yes. <laughs> My name's Becky Wiggle, I'm the curator here at the National Balloon Museum. And I'm Bob Wallagunda, and I'm uh, here uh, to represent Dr. Clayton Thomas of uh, Brimfield, Massachusetts. I'm from Pennington, New Jersey. And he's also a ballooning pioneer in his own right. And all of these people are full of hot air. Now, we're going to start and have just a little background. I, I would like the story of how you got your name. Well, one fine, bright morning, uh, I was teaching a fellow who showed up for his lessons in a bright yellow flight suit. It was the 70s, after all. <laughs> and uh, the sun beat down on that and reflected back and almost blinded me. And I said, my God, you look like a herniated canary. To which my student took umbrage and said, you're no prize in the morning yourself. So if I'm going to be Captain Canary, you're going to be Captain Fogg. And that's the way it's been ever since. Fogg, P-H-O-G-G -G from Flint, P-H-L-I-N-T, and we have a lot of P-H-U-N-N. -N. <laughs> and the story has some merit in that that student has won multiple U.S. National Championships and World Championships, and I'm proud to have had the opportunity to teach Bruce, Bruce Comstock how to fly. And Bruce sent a very nice letter where he was saying that your ability to teach him, and also, do you remember all those particular names or numbers of, do you remember any of those numbers of how many, like 18, champions and and it just kept going on and on and on about you know well i've been very fortunate i i enjoy teaching first of all and i was able i've taught uh, bruce and al nels and uh, chuck earler all who have become u.s national champions i think al won two and bruce has won what six national championships yes uh, six right. uh so I'm reminded a little bit of the story of the Michigan basketball coach who was bragging about his new recruit who could stand flat-footed at the edge of the basket, jump up flat-footed and touch the rim with his elbow, to which he said, now that's good coaching. <laughs> so I look at Bruce and Al and... <laughs> That's good teaching. Yeah. <laughs> they have such an immense talent. Yeah. Uh, it's nice to have had the opportunity to teach them. Yeah, Bruce was here for Dr. Grab last year because he, Dr. Grab got him into into ballooning and then you got to teach him after he got into it. Right. And he was saying that, um, and he's been out of ballooning for many years, and he t we had him speaking and he was doing this and then this year he he got a, a balloon and i said well did coming back to indianola have any you know getting the juices going and he laughed he goes well it might have not hurt he said but i can't believe all the paperwork it takes just to get a balloon now <laughs> he said you have to kill a tree to fly a balloon yeah that's but anyway true. It's and now, different. now i'm guessing that you he also taught you right yeah yeah I, I, we really never had lessons per mm -hmm. se. Um, I just started jumping in the basket early on, and um, 
at nine months. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you did some jumping, huh? Yeah. And then um, I remember being a very, very little kid. I would crawl into the basket uh, when it was laying down uh, and sort of hide between the console. that was the old Raven consoles and the lay down tanks, and I would sort of hide there. And then uh, the balloon would stand up, and I'd, I'd stay in there. And then we'd take off, and I'd climb up and sit on the edge of the basket and fly by remote control oh. for a while. And oh. then most of the passengers were looking out, not looking in, so they wouldn't know that I was flying. <laughs> yeah, they were flying by a five-year-old yeah. or something. <laughs> well, so I was teaching two American airline pilots how to fly, and they, jet jackies are not, uh, they're not naturals at flying hot air balloons. Uh, they tend to be too stick-oriented where they think that, boy, I'm going to get an instant response for whatever action that I'm trying to create, and they take forever to settle down and realize you got to anticipate more. And Eric was flying. I remember this flight because Eric was flying, and then we had that little remote control, which was unknown to the two well, students. I was going to say, were there many that were flying with that, or just no. because? Uh, no. Because I've not heard of remote control oh, yes. this, it, this it, early, it, anyway. It, it, Raven had put the sucker out, and it was just an electronic blast valve, and you ran it by pushing the button. And these guys were going all over the sky. I couldn't get them to fly level, and I finally said, look, why don't you guys just take a break? What I want you to do is to mentally fly the balloon. Somebody else is going to fly it. And I got my hand up as though I am the guy going to fly the balloon with my hand on the burner throttles. And in reality, Eric flew the blue. <laughs> Eric flew dead level, perfect. And I, after a while, I told the guys, I said, let me show you something. And he looked over, the both of them looked over, and they saw that this kid was <laughs> flying the balloon more, at a more level, uh, with more level ability le than, the, than they were. And, uh, and we showed him how and what. And it was. Eric, I think, got it by osmosis. He was he's a darn good pilot, awesome pilot. Well, your father was raving about that you probably put him to shame for being a pilot. No, you promised you would I know, not I know, but I just had to slip that in there. I had to slip that in there. I, that right. in there. I totally agree with him. You? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last year, I mean, you grew up with ballooning. The Whitaker girls grew up oh. with ballooning. David Grab and his sisters blew up with ballooning. And and it uh, just being around and they did everything from crewing to laying out you know I think that helps too and they all went on to some type of aviation whether rather than you know like uh, like uh, the one of the girls is uh, being an Airbus they're flying an Airbus and one of them is doing 747s and then David Grab is like all over the world with 747s and stuff and they started with ballooning and continued with aviation and do you think it would it's better to have a feel for the light fantastic on that end and then go that right because you were saying just because they have a an air an aviation you know on the stick that that it's not the same I mean totally not the same what do you think on that Oh, I I, uh, I agree with Dennis. I think that um, <clears throat> most most uh, pilots, and uh, I mean I mean I'm a pilot myself, but I learned how to fly balloons uh, first, and I think that uh, uh, that's a better way to learn to fly a balloon and then fl uh, fly an aircraft. So I saw in his resume that he does that. Do you fly airplanes too? No, not now. I I started out in fixed wing. And uh, was had like 30 hours of fixed wing experience and was ready for my check ride, and then jumped into a balloon quite by accident, but got into ballooning and never went back to fixed wing. Well, I think a lot of people get into ballooning by accident. I mean, it's just like you happen to be in the field, you know, and go from there. Yeah. Logically. Yeah. And now well, I'm going to ask. Now you've all you were all at the nationals in the early 70s, and. I want to, your view, because there, it's a lot of different than, I mean, our, we have a good race here, and it's a, it's a lot like the Nationals, but uh, it's come a long way. And what are some of your feelings or thoughts or memories of the Nationals when you and your family came? Well, I, I think I was in my mom's womb. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> when, uh, when I was at the Nationals. And then, and then I guess I was here in the early 70s. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I haven't been back since. Oh. 73, 74, 75, somewhere yeah. in there. I was born in 73, so oh. I think I was here as like a really, really young oh, yeah, baby. Oh, child. So, yeah, so yeah. I don't really have any memories, uh, memories of it. Okay. No. All right. How about you? Well, I don't have any memories for opposite reasons. I've lived too long. <laughs> but, but one of those, uh, the, when you use the term pioneers and uh, about Bob and myself and some of the other folks that were here in their early 70s, and, and Bob and I were t talking about this last night, uh, we're lucky to be alive. Uh, the we're flying with burners that put out two and a quarter million BTUs each, and felt pretty cocky because we had two of them. Uh, and to, to, compared to a single burner today that has eighteen to nineteen million BTUs, so when you're flying that type of an aircraft, it's not very forgiving. If if you start a descent that's too rapid, you only have one alternative, and that's to hit the ground. Whereas today, you can burn your way out of a too rapid descent uh, and then vent to keep yourself from going back up like a rocket ship. I used to liken it to if you wanted to make a, an exit on an expressway in the old days with the two and a quarter million BTUs, you had to start turning your wheel, your steering wheel, about three exits before you wanted to exit in order to get the right exit. and. Today, you can go right up to the exit and get right off because you have more sophisticated equipment. When we look back now and realize how technologically <laughs> deficient we were compared to the flight we had last night with Al, goodness gracious, he gets, he's got more electronics in the basket than I got in my living room. <laughs> it's just marvelous what has grown and evolved to where you've got a track that you can fly on and you can plot it right on your iPad. Well, obviously we didn't have iPads. And the attitude at that time was, we don't want electronics in the basket because that isn't with the spirit of ballooning, which is freedom from the restrictions of the earthly bonds. Well, we still have a few pilots that believe that and fly only with a map. And without the, that, well, that's fine. Yeah, we just didn't have any choices. Yeah, I mean, no. we had to no. do it that way. And no. uh, you know, today you measure in inches from the target, whereas when we were flying, you measured in blocks. <laughs> <laughs> also, I think it's uh, when we were flying, there, there weren't very many people before us, so we we kind of learned by trial and error. Yeah, and. Um, Probably I mean, more error than yeah, anything else. The, the, yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> well, it, it, you used to be able to get a uh, balloon license in a post office. You know, you didn't need any training. But most of the training was done on tethers, um, <laughs> where where you would uh, uh, learn to take off and land and and maneuver. You know, while you're on a rope, and uh, then uh, c'est la vie. But um, I know for me, and I'm sure for Dennis, you know, as we flew and, and logged more hours, uh, we got more competent. And, but there was nobody there to teach us um, because when we learned, uh, we learned from people that, that didn't know anything really about flying. They had just gotten the balloon and um, so we, we found it out trial and error. Uh, I think it's, it's a credit to... Uh, some of the pilots today, um, and I'm here representing uh, Dr. Clayton Thomas, because his emphasis was um, on safety. Um, he's a, a friend, and we used to parachute together. Uh, uh, Jacques Andres Estel uh, started uh, Parachutes Incorporated, and uh, his emphasis was always on safety, and that was Dr. Thomas, and uh, he's won numerous safety awards for. Um, from the BFA and from the NAA, and uh, with his flight curriculum uh, and flight checks, all emphasizing safety. But it was something that, um, now I trained Dr. Thomas, but I didn't have a lot of hours when I trained Dr. Thomas. 
So I think each one is a benefactor from, from the previous uh, generation. And uh, uh, we see less accidents, uh, less incidents today than, than, than uh, probably we had, or, or at least were reported back then. <laughs> so how many hours did you have in the air when you got your license? Uh, I, I learned on a tether. I didn't have any. So hours. you didn't have any free. My, my, free my flight. first uh, free flight was my solo flight. Now, around here they were saying that the FAA, you know, they were supposed to sign you off, but the f first guy who flew, they had a rough landing because they didn't know how to land, and he broke his leg. So after that, they said, just watch him from the ground, and then if they don't kill themselves, pass him. I think. Is that kind that's of. That's exactly, in, in my instance, uh, I. My first, uh, my check ride was at three feet. Uh, <laughs> got, got off the ground three was it feet. On, was it a tether? On tether or, oh, yeah. Okay. Came back down and they said, congratulations. Uh, and then uh, uh, that was when he wrote the student thing out. And then uh, when I was teaching people, the FAA, and, and then the FAA had examiners at that point coming out, they drove in the car. Yeah. That that was literally, yeah. Uh, and I would ride with the FAA inspector and say, "No, he's doing the." I was teaching the FAA yeah. inspector what was going on, and it was great yeah. because none of my students failed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, and then at some point we became the FAA uh, designated examiners. Yeah, and and that's kind of how it went. So but both of you are designated. I'm not a designated oh. examiner. Yeah, no. I, yeah, and. And well, I was, and and that's that's kind of again, it evolved into a situation where, um, and Denny's right. Uh, most most of the early FAA people, they had no ballooning experience. They didn't. It was uh, it was something that was totally foreign to them, and they would they would be on the ground, and a lot of them were frankly, uh, I wouldn't say they were afraid to fly, but in a balloon, but they just didn't know anything about them. Well, they certainly were reluctant. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. a good word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. It, and Bob's, Bob makes a good point. We, we not only learn by trial and error, but we learn from each other. Uh, and in spite of the ego clashes and all that kind of stuff, it was amazing how much camaraderie there was between pilots who would teach each other. Now part of it I think was a guy learned something so he wanted to brag that he learned something. Uh, yeah. But the, who cares? We learn. Yeah. You know, Matt Whitaker, for example, taught me about warming propane. I didn't have a clue. Yeah, uh, his his wife told me well, I was trying to track you down, and she said she gave me your number, and she said, "You just tell him I remember him I, I, because of me. He won the national championship because she took the, his tanks and warmed them in the bathtub." Right. Yeah. <laughs> and things like that. Um, I remember flying with Frank Pritchard, another U.S. national champion and the two of us we really kind of learned together mm. in Michigan and we were out one day with a uh, this is when we learned that you really probably shouldn't be flying much beyond 10 or 11 in the morning because there were those little invisible things called <laughs> thermals, thermals. Yeah. we literally for 20 minutes over a field got caught in a thermal that just bounced this boom and we were doing it around a, a small clump of trees and we went boom and we came up and boom boom 20 minutes of that my son is taller than i am but i used to be taller than he is <laughs> it does 20 minutes of booming 20 minutes of those landings and it shortens you up a touch i'll tell you yeah but that's how we learn but matt was saying that that's he he said that exactly it's the same thing you know it'd be a beautiful day so they'd go all right they go out and fly maybe it'd be at noon and then they'd be thrown around and then he called don't be going up at noon he says there's it's thermals and everything else and so you'd spread out the word nobody'd go that and so somebody find a good time to do it they'd spread that out it was all by by trial and error exactly and and like did you how many did you fly before because he flew quite a while before he even had a license. They didn't even have licenses. Well, my, you know, you talk about thermals. Um, I, it was 19, I'm guessing he's 69 or 70, and I was doing a promotion down in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. 
and it was their tricentennial, the three cities. And um, it was about 12 noon. You know? <laughs> and, and I'm looking at the flags and I'm saying, all right, got it. You know, it's the winds, because normally you, you're worried about the wind picking up by that mm -hmm. time in the morning. And there was just, the flag would just flutter a little bit. And uh, I got in and when I took off, uh, uh, the, the tower operator, who the airport was close, uh, said, man, you look like a homesick angel. <laughs> <laughs> I went up to 13,000 feet with no heat, basically no more uh, oh, heat than wow. I put in initially to lift off. And, um, and then what do you do on the way up? What do you do on the way down? You know, you, you, you've got to be careful because you've got to put heat into it and you, you can't let it cool off to where it's it, it gets so cold, streamers yeah. down. And, and again, we've, we had to figure that out ourselves because um, uh, no one was there to teach us. And uh, like Denny said, we're very fortunate to uh, have uh, gotten through those tough times. Now, like in Iowa, we fly morning and evening, weather permitting. Yeah. And I know west of like Nebraska with the mountains and everything, they only fly in the morning. All right, the East Coast. Now, I was in Florida, and they only fly in the morning in right. Florida. I'm imagining it's the same thing. So how is it, like, up in your area, in the New England? We fly morning and evening, uh, wind and weather permitting. And, and the, the, the interesting thing was, uh, and, and I did, did mostly commercial ballooning my entire tenure in ballooning, but um, we, we used to promote it weather permitting, and then... Uh, quickly we learned it was wind and weather permitting. Mm. And we added that in there because uh, that was an issue. But um, we, we've, we do have many mornings and many evenings that are, are very flyable in New England. Uh, the problem you have in New England um, is twofold. Number one, as you go further north, the, the landing areas are, are uh, few and far between. And secondly, you've got hills and mountains and uh, when you get wind around mountains, uh, it, it becomes uh, very risky sometimes. So, uh, but we do try to uh, get down, er fly early enough and get down on the ground early enough where you don't run into any wind problems or thermal problems. And then in the afternoon, the same thing. However, um, there are other things. There's um, um, the, the breeze that comes off the ocean is, is an issue. Um, and most people, again, we learned that by trial and error. We didn't know that. So um, all of a sudden it'd be calm at 6 o'clock, and then 6.30 it's blowing 20 knots. Mm. And, uh, it, you know, it, 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 it's one of those things that uh, as, as you uh, flew and, and the more time you put in and the more um, conditions you flew under, you realized and you learned, you know. Uh, now I think uh, they've got everything, as, as uh, Danny was saying, on, on, uh, on computer and uh, uh, charts. And, and, uh, but when we were there, we didn't have that advantage. You know? uh, so we had some very interesting flights. <laughs> so like now, I mean, before anybody flies, they, they call weather and they, you know, and check with that. When, when did that sort start to happen so that the weather people were even up on ballooning. Do you know when that? It started, I think, in the early 70s. Uh, you know, one person discovers that, gee, if I dial the weather service, mm -hmm. I can figure out what the winds are. They'll tell me. And eventually the balloonists <clears throat> evolved from being these wild-eyed, almost, you might say, hippie-type people. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. to a more professional aviator and the most of the balloon pilots today, this is just my opinion, but most of the balloon pilots today are truly professional pilots. Yeah. Uh, even though they may only have a private license, they have to follow the same procedures as a true professional pilot follows in order to be in the air and land safely. And safety, I'm not saying that we weren't concerned about safety, but when we started, I think survival was sort of the mark. As long as you, any landing you could walk away from, 
was considered a good landing. I think the standard's a touch higher today. Uh, property owner relations. Uh, well, we learned through some errors that, gee, maybe we shouldn't be so offensive in taking out a farmer's field. fence yeah, or field or, or crops. Or house or little by little, mm -hmm. you, you acquire a body of knowledge and then you transmit that body of knowledge. And then the next person discovers more and they transmit a bigger body of knowledge and that's what has happened. Yeah, I think too, uh, the FAA we talked about early on, um, um, uh, not to, to denigrate the early um, FAA people, but uh, they just didn't know anything about balloons. Know. But um, I think it was important that uh, as we found out about weather, they cooperated and, and we, we we then got, uh, they weren't interested in winds less than 10 miles an hour, for the most part, because nobody cared, and with an airplane, that's standard. But um, as, as there were more balloon people um, coming on the scene, uh, they, they started uh, working with us, and, and uh, we were able to say winds less than 10, or they give us light and variable, or, or they give you a better feel, or up where in New Jersey, the sea breeze that I had spoken about earlier, um, they get they got involved with that and and um, uh, that really helped. So I think I think as ballooning evolved, uh, it not only evolved through ballooning but through aviation. And um, but again, we we uh, um, we didn't have the advantage of that at the time. And and in some cases, it was a surprise. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say in many cases yeah. it was a surprise. <laughs> now around here. The very first, we had a balloon club, like like yeah. you did, and there were like about seven people, and they put their hundred dollars in, and they and that was their part, and then they all, one got to fly it, and then the rest of them crewed or and it rotated. Now I noticed you had yours started similar to that. Do you want to? Well, mine, I got involved because of a political affiliation for us, congressman. Uh, and, it, and we formed the Flint Sport Balloon Club in order to fund the purchase of a balloon and the training of a pilot or two in order to promote the re-election. That was, it was different oh, than oh, the average I person. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was approached at a cocktail party and, and asked if I would be one of the ten people that he thought was necessary to form a group to buy a balloon to promote Congressman Don Regal's campaign. And I was not too impressed with the idea at first, but as the evening wore on and uh, the consumption increased, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, heck yes, why not, you know? Uh, and that's how I got into it. What happened, very honestly, is because I was you know, basically a sole proprietor of my own business, mm -hmm. I had the ability to arrange my schedule. So myself and Frank Richard became the two who had the most time available, and we were the ones that started flying. Once I took a flight, I was dead meat. I was hooked. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 I mean, I just, there was nothing that it could uh, get me out of a balloon. And, and like I said, I never went back to fixed wing. This was the juice that I was looking for. Well, that, that's kind of like Malcolm Forbes always said that his first flight, he and Denny Fleck took their first flight for $50 and he said the next one cost him 500000 Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and so on the East Coast, did they start with like balloon clubs where they, you know, like we have balloon clubs now where everybody has their own balloon and then they kind of fly together. Believe but, it or no, there weren't that many balloon clubs. I um, like Denny, I mean, when I saw my first balloon, uh, this the, this fellow brought it to the college I was attending, and uh, like all of us, um, and, you know, I was taking lessons the next morning. You know, I mean, the very next morning. I mean, that that's how it it, it got to me, and uh, the balloon fever, and uh, so uh, what I did was uh, I I. I ultimately went into the balloon business because that was, you know, where, where my direction was. But, um, so what we did is, is uh, as we got into the balloon business, we tried to sell balloons to, to people. 
the club opportunity was there because it was a good sales uh, way to get five or ten people together and it would reduce the costs. Um, but um, there weren't that many clubs uh, early on in New England. There weren't many balloons early on in New yeah. England. Yeah. But um, there were some and, and ultimately uh, if it wasn't a club it was a partnership you know that, that evolved. And of course, uh, but I would say there was probably more individual owners and partnerships than there were clubs. See, um, my husband and I, uh, we were the <laughs> very first individual balloon then the banks didn't know what to do with it. You know, they, they tried to treat it like a car and they <laughs> wanted the, they wanted, I said, well, the, the license has to stay with it. They had, you know, on the flight yeah. line. And they said, no, it, it needs to go to the bank. I said, no, we have to go. And so we went round and round because the banks didn't know what to do with it either. And so besides the BFA and everything else, and finally we just had to come to an understanding and, and and went from with that because all they'd ever dealt with was the clubs and you know they nobody really owned it so it was I mean it was kind of there but yeah and and a lot of it is just grown and grown and grown and in Iowa we have we've got a lot of second generation and going on to third generation balloonists and it's always been you there's no in between in ballooning you're either hooked or you don't like it yeah Love it or leave it. It yeah. just, uh, and, and of all the people that I've taught, and I've taught a lot of people, uh, and of all the students that I've had, I have only had one person that I can truly say, you should not be doing this. And fortunately, that gentleman recognized it. Oh, on his own? On his own, at about the same time, he just he had neither the confidence in himself, aviation-wise, uh, or the ability. And uh, I wrote a check. I gave him all his money back. He paid me up front for his lesson. I says, "Here, take your money." <laughs> and he, he says, "Well," and he argued with me that I should keep some. I said, "No, you go." Uh, yeah. And he was grateful, and I'm grateful, and the sport of ballooning should be grateful. <laughs> Now, I want to ask about Dr. Thomas. Uh, how did he earn, you know, you said he's all into safety, but then he's called the, the uh, dare, daredevil of ding well, ding dell Well, I, I think uh, back then, uh, you know, Dr. Thomas is a flight surgeon and uh, um, got his degrees from Harvard and uh, is, is a pretty well-known physician in the area. And um, flying balloons in those early days, you know, uh, mm. they kind of looked at you like, yeah. uh, I, I know when I first nuts. got into ballooning, <laughs> most people laughed at me. And, yeah. and especially when you went into the balloon business, yeah. they, they laughed even harder. So, <laughs> so what, uh, what happened was uh, he kind of got a reputation um, because he was the only one in the area that was flying. Now, in, in his... Early days, I, I was flying with him because I, um, I, we started a balloon port. It was actually his balloon port uh, at Dingley Dell. Uh, and that, that was the, he lived on Festiniog Farm. I know. And so, would you I mean, explain, you know, explain so when that? You said the Daredevil, well, it was an estate that um, was named uh, after uh, a Welsh estate. And uh, it, it, had, it was a beautiful area. It had uh, lakes. And uh, he started uh, the balloon port uh, of Massachusetts at uh, at his uh, estate. So uh, we did all of our early flying from there, and then ultimately he purchased the balloon, and then we flew together from there. But um, his his uh, nickname was was because early on he was the only one in the area, and he um, uh, people thought that uh, ballooning was. Um, something that uh, was very unusual. And, and then if you look at Dr. Thomas, uh, he's, he's, he is uh, a very, very funny guy. And, uh, you know, uh, like, like a lot of balloonists, I mean, they have certain traits that uh, are a little different. And um, he, uh, he earned the reputation of being a daredevil, basically because of the stories that were told about 
some of his flying, which for balloonists were, you know, r run of the mill. Run of the mill. Yeah. <laughs> but, he, was, but, he was no crazier than yeah, the rest of us. <laughs> but uh, to the to the general public, uh, so he got the nickname Daredevil of Dingley Dell. <laughs> and they and you were talking about his helmet and how it came over that, and I was asking. Why? Because well, we didn't have any. Yeah, because he was a safety-oriented uh, guy, and and he felt uh, up in New England we used to fly through a lot of trees, so he would <laughs> get his helmet and he'd just put his visor down, and he wouldn't have to worry about a branch hitting him in the eye. I mean, for him, it was a very simple safety uh, conscious conscious thing. process. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can sh share with you, Bob and I were reminiscing about. Uh, Dr. Thomas flying here in Indian, in Indian Ocean. Yeah. Bruce Comstock and I were co-pilots of the uh, hair balloon. And of course I'd fly for a while and then Bruce would fly for a while and we were just trying to show off and outdo each other. So we were all over the sky. <laughs> and these poor <laughs> hair, uh, or, uh, they're trying to follow the hair balloon, the other pilots, and oh my gosh. We finally came to the recognition that, oops, we, we, we should really settle down and find a nice landing site, put the target out and do what we're supposed to do. Whereupon we descended from a very high altitude at a very steep rate, flared right out and landed on a piece of beautiful grass at the edge of a lake that you had to go across before you could land. Could land. Well, Dr. Thomas was pretty close behind us, and he came down too. Very rapid rated descent. Only he couldn't stop the descent over the water. <clears throat> so the last image, in, or excuse me, the, the, the first image is Dr. Thomas standing there, hands like this, and that balloon went deep into the water up to the edge of the skirt to actually wrinkled or push the skirt up. The next image is Dr. Thomas coming out of there, still got the helmet on, still got the face mask down. The only difference is he's dripping wet. And I, I, I asked Bob if he would please find out if I'm yet forgiven. <laughs> he was upset that we had pulled that and to us, it was just a feat of skill to level out and get yeah. across. And so what happened after? He came out? Oh, and he bounced what? back up. Now he's overheated. Yeah, so he goes he over and he misses it. Yeah, there. he comes screaming out of there, dripping, dripping testy words. Yo. Well, you were talking about putting an axe. I've read several things about in the early times, and they didn't have axes. And to mark their things, sometimes they would be burning tires, and some of them they would put the balloon down, and you had to aim at the balloon, and you never landed there. Well, Do you remember those? Well, when we first started, the idea was you landed near the target, yeah. and, the closest and, and to the target landing, or the final resting spot, or the final resting spot, whichever right? Closer. Whichever was close. No, whichever was Further, furthest. Furthest apart. Right. Um, so you had the, 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 the perfect landing uh, or target was when you landed right next to the, ba your basket was next to the uh, hair basket and boom, you stopped. Yeah. Uh huh. And so the first one had, was only had, had a chance, nobody else oh, had Oh no, because you could can't. land on the other side. Oh, okay. Uh, or you could right. land right up against it. But like I said, if you got in the same field, it was outstanding. It just didn't. Yeah. And then we did, you know, again, the learning curve began, and we realized, oops, if you really do come in real tight to the target, you're liable to crash into the target's basket. Basket, yeah. Or and the so, balloon. Or well, yeah. the balloon. Yeah. yeah that, and I believe somebody did lose some yeah. fabric on the, one of those lines. When did they start with baggies? Do you know? I don't know exactly, but I'd say mid '70s. Uh, uh, yeah, um, and there was a lot of controversy about the baggies. Oh uh, gosh, yes. Because you know you could throw your baggie, and you know it, it got to be who had the best arm, 
you know, as, as or the heaviest baggie, or the heaviest baggie. Oh, they weren't yeah. even. Oh. They weren't equal. Well, or did you have no. to come up with your own baggie, or did they? Uh, supply they were them? all kind. They started supplying them, but guys were soaking them in water and making them oh, heavier yeah. and all oh. kinds of stuff. But but that was an evolution because when when people came down on a hare and hound, um, initially it was the closest one to the basket. But they'd hit the ground first, and they'd bounce. So they'd say, oh, you hit the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, w the rules evolved right. wow. as to who was legitimately uh, the winner of the race and the, and the closer to the basket. So um, that was sort of a, a, a real uh, change in, in rules when they started with the baggies. And it was probably more of a convenience than a... Than a um, well, I think there are some safety issues that yeah. they were addressing at the same time, right, as well as convenience. It, it, I mean, it, may, it makes sense. It makes sense, yeah. And now that you've got standardization, every baggie is the same weight mm. and size, and the streamer is so... It, once you get it standardized, it's fine. The biggest controversy, like in the World Championships, was, uh, and, and prior to that, was the use of barographs. Yeah. Can can you guys go into barographs? There was a lady. I I know what a barograph is, and in fact, I just got another one today. And I understand that you hooked them on, and it was an altitude thing. But I can't figure out how they work because I know this little lever goes up and down. But I, and then the observers took the place for that. But how can you tell when they took off because the oh. observers and well, well, and, first... and how and how does it know? that you're doing it. It's just this little lever and I don't... Alright, right. start with the premise that first of all it is a recording altimeter. Okay. That's what a barograph is. It records your altitude and time. So the original barograph charts would come up and I'll yeah. just make these numbers up to illustrate yeah. your point. You fly to 500 feet and then you got a 100 foot box 